good morrow, and welcome to episode two of the English Heritage History at Home live series. Hooray! If you joined us last time, then thank you. It's great to see you again. And if this is your first time dropping by, then give yourself a little pat on the back, because frankly, you have made an impeccable decision. My name is Ben Shires. I'm a TV presenter, vintage waistcoat enthusiast and lover of English heritage and all its fantastic sights. Although like many of you right now, I'm currently at home. I live in the historic city of York in England and I'd love to know where in the world you are and which are your favourite historical places to visit to. So please make sure to leave us a comment and we'll try to give you a shout out as we go along. Plus, we'll also be answering your questions on today's topic a little bit later on too. We'll be finding out what that is shortly. But before that, we need to take a quick rewind to our previous episode where we challenged you to make your very own version of Stonehenge using objects found around your house. And you certainly didn't disappoint. So here are some of our favourites. First up is this Rainbow Henge from Joanne, complete with sunrise. Uh, which is quite appropriate, I'm sure you'll agree, for the times that we're currently living in. Brilliant work, Joanne. Uh, the next one coming up, well, it's a marshmallow Stonehenge made by sisters Ellie, Ella, Evie and Erin, who are in Scotland. Uh, we were really impressed by the way they've managed to illustrate the two different types of rock used with marshmallows, and even more impressed that they didn't eat the whole thing before they took that picture. So well done to you girls. Uh, next up, we have a Lego Henge built by nine-year-old Lilac and her auntie, Laurie. Uh, they're obviously paying attention uh, to last week because look at the joints uh, that they've used, just like the actual stone henge, which, as we know, look a little bit like early Lego bricks. While seven-year-old Thomas, right here, uh, used pencils to roll Jenga blocks into place to build his stone henge. It's absolutely ingenious. And, of course, that mimics the way that our ancestors would have used wooden rollers to move their stones. Uh, next up here, we've got Stephen's nine-year-old daughter who built this stone circle out of books and not just any books. Some very impressive historical looking books, actually, and bonus points for the one about King Arthur. Well done there. And finally, Connor used toilet roll and kitchen roll, uh, and uh, Patrick used Lego uh, to build their hinges. And Patrick's has even got the visitor barrier around it that's used to stop the stones from getting damaged. Absolutely love that detail. There you have it. Well done. Thank you to everyone who gave it a go. Some stunning stone hinges there. Uh, and there'll be another challenge to get stuck into at the end of today's episode. Might have been a little bit of a clue there. Speaking of which, we better seize a moment yeah, and get cracking because today's topic is the Romans and Hadrian's Wall. And to help us scale that wall is our very own Roman expert, Mark Douglas. Hello, Mark. Hi, how are you doing? I'm great. It's lovely to have you join us, Mark. So firstly, can you tell us what your job is, please? Yeah, Ben. Um, I'm what's known as the properties curator for English heritage. That means I look after all of the English heritage properties in the north of England. Um, and that ranges from um, Henge Monuments, strangely enough, in Cumbria, to a, in date-wise, up to a, um, a nuclear bunker um, in York, and anything in between, which, of course, can be anything from castles to monasteries to various other things. But, of course, the, the most, most important thing and most pertinent thing we were talking about is the Great Hadrian's Wall um, across Cumbria and Northumberland, which I have about eight miles to look after. Fantastic. What a pleasure that must be, Mark. And it probably makes you one of the very last Roman legionaries to defend their forts. Now, Roman Britain was always one of my favourite topics at school. It really, really was. So I can't wait to learn some more about it. But first, I think we need to go back even further in time before the Romans even came to Britain at all. So, Mark, what were they up to over 2000 years ago in the first century BC? Right, Ben, yeah. Well, the, the Romans themselves um, started a long, long time before that, of course. Um, but the whole idea of the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic before that, was based on this idea of expansion, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and this was for two two reasons. One was to uh, to bring in wealth, to bring in, to bring in goods, to bring in uh, prosperity to, the, to, to Rome itself. 
and also for the for the glory of the 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 the, the Caesar for see, for Caesar themselves or um, the emperor. So it was it was all about um, maintaining the glory of Rome. Um, and this is the where we got to just before the conquest of, of Britain. It was you know Rome was the empire was quite large. It had a few more steps to take. I see. So the Romans were obsessed with increasing the size of their empire, basically. It's always made me wonder if they visited the capital of Ireland, because, you know, that is always Dublin. Do you get it? Dublin, because it's no. like Dublin. Mm -hmm. nice. Very good. I'm wasted here. I'm wasted here, Mark. Uh, anyway, the next name in our story is, frankly, one of the biggest names of all time, Julius Caesar. And when he wasn't lending his name to salads and obstetrics, he was a dab hand at conquest. So, Mark, who was Caesar and why did he set his heart on Britain? Because it's a lot colder than Rome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bri <laughs> well, Caesar um, uh, was not an emperor. Caesar was, was, a, was a dictator. Caesar was the, um, the leader of the Roman Republic. <clears throat> and um, what he needed to do to maintain his power base was to keep conquering lands which has been spoken about. And um, in the sort of the, 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 the mid, mid first century BC, um, Caesar was engaged in what he called his Gallic Wars. He was fighting in, in Gaul, which is now modern France. Um, I'm having a, you know, a fair old time by it, but uh, you know, hitting a few problems. Um, and one of the problems was that he had with, 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 with Britain, Britain was sending aid and help to the, to the Gaulish tribes. Um, and so Caesar decided to put them in the place and he took two legions across the channel and sort of had a bit of a holiday um, wandering around the south coast and doing a bit of damage and um, finally sailing back to, uh, to Gaul, job done. And that was the Caesar's first invasion of, of, of Britain. I see. And uh, I presume there was a second invasion as well. So what happened in that one? Yeah. Okay. So the, the clue of the first invasion was, in fact, there was a second invasion in the following year. And this time Caesar went at, at a bit more of a go at things and uh, brought a lot more troops and certainly penetrated further inland up towards, from the southeast, up towards uh, the, 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 the London area and the, the Thames, the Thames or Valley. <clears throat> um, I swung around, did a bit of damage, you know, took a few hostages and basically ended up um, receiving the, 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 the submission of the southern tribes of, uh, of Britain and then and also a, the tribute of those of, of Britain as well. So basically it was, a, again, another job well done. Good, good one. A, 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 a brownie points for Caesar by the time he got back to Romans. You know, the, the, uh, not the conquest, but certainly the, the submission of, um, of, of, uh, of Britain was under his belt. So Caesar's happy, he's plumped up his CV, he's got another country paying him money and sending him goods. But um, one of his famous quotes, I'm sure we've all heard it, uh, in, in the Latin is veni vidi vici, or I came, I saw, I conquered. He didn't really conquer Britain though, did he? So if he didn't, who did? You're right, he didn't conquer Britain. Um, and there was no really reason to conquer Britain at the time. Britain was across the sea, it offered no threat. It was paying tribute and, you know, Rome was, Rome was doing quite nicely by it. But as I said earlier, um, the empire thrived on expansion and emperors themselves thrived and, 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 uh, and fell or stood by the amount of glory they could, um, they could take on themselves. So um, this brings us on to a chap called Claudius. Um, Claudius uh, was um, the emperor who finally did uh, manage to get across into Britain and, and start the conquest of Britain. Claudius was um, was followed a, a, a rather unpopular chap called um, Caligula, who was a, not very popular and not not a, not, a, not a great emperor, quite quite uh, quite the reverse, um, in fact. Um, and Claudius had a big job. Claudius himself was quite old when he came to came to the to, to, to the emperorship as you want to put it that way um and again wasn't that wasn't amazingly popular he needed some really killer and so he decided what he'd do he'd conquer he'd conquer britain and um he set sail across the channel like caesar did in, in 100 years before with a, a large troop of men this time he brought twenty thousand legionary soldiers and twenty thousand auxiliary soldiers so that's forty thousand men he wasn't going back he meant business, and um, this this was the first 
foothold in southern Britain. And from that point onwards, the Roman Empire just ate its way through the country from the southeast up towards the north. And beyond, way beyond, beyond, beyond the north of England, beyond where Hedges Wall is now, right up northern Scotland. Um, and as we can see on the slide there, you can see that this is the, this is the full extent of the empire in, uh, in, in 117 AD. This is just before the critical time. This is just before the wall is built. And the, the, the empire is its, is its, is its largest. Um, by this time, in 717 AD, the, the, the line of the northern border of the empire was along the line of what was going to become Hadrian's Wall. Okay, so we finally reached the main man himself when we're talking about this famous wall. It is Emperor Hadrian. Um, I think we've got a picture of him here that we can see as well. There he is. Uh, first impressions, he's obviously a hipster. Look at the hair and the beard. Um, but what I want to know is who was he really, Mark? Why did he want to build a wall in the first place? And why couldn't he just be content in having one at the bottom of his garden like the rest of us? You may have been, um, Hadrian is, uh, is, you know, is probably seen as one of the great emperors, one of the, the, the four great emperors of, of the Roman Empire, um, and did so much to, uh, to, 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 to set the institution up. Um, he, he was a man who, who spent most of his time traveling around from, from the time he became emperor, from, from, from uh, 117 AD, um, traveling around the, the, the provinces and, and inspecting the troops, keeping himself seen, making himself popular. He also, um, he, he became a new policy. The new policy was that he thought the, the empire had grown big enough it was becoming unwieldy. It was becoming difficult to defend. We had enough. We had, had enough space. They had enough people. They had enough clients. They had enough uh, colonization. What Hadrian wanted to do then was to to consolidate, to make Rome, the Roman Empire, safe from the inside. And so, hence, we start thinking now about hard borders as opposed to <clears throat> just just lines on maps. Um, Hadrian was a great builder. He was a he was um, he was you know, a, a, a great thinker. Um, and it was during one of his, um, his tours of Northern Britain in AD 22, 122, that um, he, pro he proclaimed that he would build a wall across the top of Northern Britain. Now, there's, there's reasons for this. this. This could be for defence. It could be for, um, it could be for to keep people in, to keep people out, to, as, a, as a customs border. But one of the things I do like to think about, and I think it's, this, it's, been, it's been thought about in, in the past about what Hadrian's motives might be, is that because emperors needed to do something big, emperors needed to do something impressive during their time um, in office, that when you couldn't expand, when you couldn't take over more countries, when your, your, your plan was not to, not to do more conquest, you did something really quite impressive along some of the lines, which, which would involve something like building a huge wall across a complete country. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting that you should mention that, Mark, because it's got me thinking, you know, he's a leader of vast lands who's concerned with his reputation, who wants to build a wall across a border to stop people getting in. Where have I heard that a bit more recently, I wonder? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll leave you to mull on that. We are going to take a few shout outs now. You guys have been getting in touch. Uh, so let's see who's uh, joining us today. Firstly, Kate and Joe, age nine from York, which is where I am. Hooray. And one of their favourite places is Broadworth Hall. Lovely. I haven't been there, but I'd really like to go one day. Uh, we've got mm -hmm. Alex and Emily in Cheshire, uh, in, sorry, in Oxfordshire, uh, who love Beeston Castle in Cheshire. Uh, where their nanny volunteers at the new Iron Age Roundhouse. That sounds great. Um, we've also got, hello again. Looks like we've got some uh, some people joining us once more. Josh, who's 13, Sophie, who's eight, and Aurelia, who's three, from the Isle of Wight. His dad is called Adrian, but not Adrian, and it's not his wall, even though he is that old. Ha ha. I really like that <laughs> comment with your dad. Uh, we've got hello from Harry and Isaac in Hertfordshire, who love Rest Park and Carisbrook Castle. Always a popular one here. Uh, hello from Samuel, who's 10, and Alexander, who's 6, uh, and Mummy uh, from Barrow upon Saw in Leicestershire. 
They love Kenilworth Castle and visiting York, especially seeing the Romans at the Yorkshire Museum, as do I. Well, thank you uh, for getting in touch and letting us know who you are, where you are, and what you like to visit. We'll be doing some more shout outs later, but for now, here's a short animation to give us a bit more info on why Hadrian's Wall was built. The Emperor Trajan presided over the greatest military expansion in Roman history. When he died in AD 117, his successor Hadrian was left with the daunting task of defending the empire. Special attention needed to be paid to the northernmost frontier in Britannia, where there was resistance from the barbarian natives. Hadrian came to Britain in AD 122 and decided to solve the barbarian problem by building a giant wall, a project without precedence in Europe. Initially, most of the wall was to be built in stone, but the western 30-mile section was to be made from turf. In front of both was a deep ditch, and at each mile a gate was protected by a small guard post called a mile castle. Between each pair of mile castles lay two towers. The stone wall was to be 15 Roman feet high and 10 Roman feet wide. The building of Hadrian's Wall was a complicated process that involved the entire Roman army of Britain, approximately 15,000 men. These men were not just highly trained soldiers, but also skilled craftsmen. It was decided that forts, such as Chester's, would be placed astride the wall, each housing as many as a thousand men. The designers had to contend with fierce torrents of fast rivers, hard rock and mile upon mile of rolling hills. Hadrian's Wall defined the edge of the empire in Britannia and gave the Romans control over customs, immigration and smuggling. From the point of view of the barbarians north of the wall, it must have seemed like an almost superhuman accomplishment and a daunting symbol of Rome's imperial might. Indeed, it was daunting. And here's a real for you. When is a wall not a wall? Well, when Emperor Hadrian built it, that's when. Because, Mark, yeah. this was far more than just your common old garden wall, wasn't it? What did it comprise <clears throat> of all the different elements? Yeah, you're right, Ben. Um, it was more than a wall. Uh, as we just saw the animation there, you know, there was this this thing, this 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 wall built across the whole of the, uh, the whole North of England, with addiction for this. We can see there now on this illustration, but it was more than that. There was a there was a um, it was a communications barrier. There was a there was a um, a road to the back there, the military way. We can see this this is the, a view of the south of the wall as it would have looked um, at the time. There's the uh, one of the turrets and a road there running through the uh, along the, the the south of the wall, and then just to the south of that, there's this thing. There's an amazing thing called the Vallum, which is in fact when you go up to the Tajians Wall, you'll see this. The Vallum still runs across. It's, it's probably more impressive in some instances the actual wall itself. Um, and this is a, a huge uh, um, sort of earthwork with two banks and a, a big ditch in the middle. And this acts like um, a, what we call it a, a, a demarcation zone. Beyond this point, everything is military between the Vallum and the wall. It's like a, you know, it's like a, a second barrier. Um, and then on top of that, we have uh, the, the wall itself um, and the ditch in front. I think the ditch is quite interesting. You can see there on this illustration, there's, there's, a, there's a, a suspicion that the, the ditch was filled with um, these things called kippies, um, which are sl small pits with a, a, a thorn bush planted in them but the thorn brush was was planted upside down and it was to act like almost like um roman first century barbed wire to stop people getting anywhere near the wall um that's still open to uh, discussion whether that actually was the case or not um and each uh, mile the third the thing was the roman mile the roman wall was 80 miles long and every roman mile there was a mile castle which you can see illustrated here um which would receive a garrison of about 30 men who would then um, patrol their section of wall um, up to the two turrets. There's, between each mark castle, there were two lookouts called turrets, and they would also be part of their their, their sort of their sort of uh, their, their, their parade, the parade, the guards' movements backwards and forwards across the wall, looking out for invaders. And of course, on top of all that, um, just built just slightly after, as a slight afterthought, um, were the, uh, the the forts themselves. So we probably, you know, we have that the full complement then. Forts, mark castles, turrets, ditch, wall, and vallum. Well, Mark, you said after thought, but I was thinking after forts. Um, obviously, they came slightly later, but the forts were 
very, very important in terms of the operation of the wall and how many people could be based there. So what can you tell us uh, about these structures? Yeah, the forts themselves, um, interestingly, because they, the, 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 the line of Hugin's Wall, like I said before, the actual boundary, the place it was going to be, was actually fixed before the wall was built. It was fixed with a wall, with a road called the Stangate, or that was a, an old English name for Stone Street, the Stone Road. Uh, the Stangate, which was linked by linked from uh, across the country with a certain amount of forts along there. Um, well, we, we can, you know, we've, we've seen them uh, mentioned before. Um, once the wall had been built, it was just really um, almost immediately after the wall had started construction, the decision was then to move the forts onto the wall um, as, a, as an extra power defence and also somewhere for the garrisons to be housed. <clears throat> now, in English heritage um, do have three of the most important, which are um, Housesteads, Chesters and Bird Oswald. And these, um, interestingly, would, would, would probably house around about, about five to 800 men um, up on the Bird Oswald side, on the west side, and also at Housesteads, right in the very top of the wall, right in the middle of the country. They looked like they were infantry soldiers. These were auxiliary soldiers, not, 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 not legionaries. These were chaps who were brought in from elsewhere. Um, and down at Chester's, it looks like there was it was a, actually a cavalry fort. Now, the interesting thing about these, the, 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 the idea about the forts is that the, um, the people manning these forts were auxiliary soldiers, and auxiliary soldiers were brought in from outside or from other areas of the empire. And there were, there were, these were people, um, client people, uh, people who had been colonised in the past who were not Roman citizens. And the great advantage of becoming becoming an auxiliary soldier was if you served in the in the army for twenty five years as an auxiliary, you could then become a Roman citizen with all the benefits that 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 uh, that entailed. And so that's why we find that um, at, at the sites here, for example, at Housesteads, we find uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, some Belgian troops, um, the the, uh, the the Tungrians from from Belgium or modern day Belgium, and down at Chester's, the cavalry units they were founded from a, from a, a, a they were sort of sourced and first recruited from northern Spain. So you have people coming from all over the empire to man the, the northern frontier. Which is incredible, really, because I think when we often think about Romans and, and who they were, we assume that they'd be from Rome. It seems to make sense. But in actuality, uh, the Roman ideal was much more of a concept of uh, inclusivity and diversity, bringing people together from all different places and cultures uh, in the hope of creating one great big, uh, I guess, empire is, is what they would have uh, thought of it as, but uh, a huge group of people all thinking and, and doing and, and building in the same sort of way. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think that if you think about the idea of the, um, particularly the, the idea of protecting the empire, even up to its last stages, even, even up to the, to the fourth century, people, the, the, what we call the barbarian invasions, the barbarians were very, very aware of what Rome was all about. And what they really wanted to do was to, um, was to be part of it, you know? And it, wasn't, it wasn't something that seems a bad thing. They wanted a piece of the action. And so it was, you know, um, that was sort of, the, that, that idea of, of 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 becoming a Roman citizen, becoming a part of Rome, was was held up as an inducement, as a, as a as a way of persuading people to do to various things. And of course, like you said, you know the, the advantages, the knock-on advantages of of having having baths and uh, and plum plumbing and all those things. We you know that all thing about you know what the Romans ever do for us. You know that, that is actually quite true. Absolutely, and many of their ideas seem pretty modern. It was obviously a, a pretty interesting club to be a part of if you are considered to be Roman. Speaking of interesting clubs, by the way, we are part of one ourselves here uh, in this History at Home live lesson. Uh, so I thought I'd give a few more shout outs. So Lucas, who's age 10 from West Kingsdown, uh, he says hello, he says he loves Stonehenge. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, we've got a hello from George, who's six in South Killingholm who says our favourite place to visit is Bolsover Castle, a fantastic castle there. Uh, Edward, who's aged eight in Hook, uh, who says Romans are my favourite type of history 
uh, and I want to visit Hadrian's Wall when I can. Well, hopefully one day you'll get to visit that, Edward. Um, hello from Alicia and Sylvia, who are nine and six from Hertfordshire. Alicia's school topic this week is the Romans' inventions. Well, we might be having a few things to say about that very soon. They love Rest Park and our granny takes us to visit Kenilworth Castle. Fantastic. And finally, Erin and Finn are watching in books. Uh, their favourite English heritage places to visit are Pendennis Castle and Osborne House. Uh, they can't wait to visit more soon. Fingers crossed, of course. And uh, they love history at home life. Thank you. Well, thank you, Erin and Finn. And for everyone who's watching and getting involved at the moment, it's great to hear from so many of you. We will be asking your questions to Mark shortly. But before that, there's a couple more questions that I've got of my own, Mark, because We've discussed the fact that there was Roman soldiers and Roman auxiliaries who were based along the wall, but they were also supported, weren't they, by a pretty big network of other people too, including uh, slave servants, craftspeople, their families. Um, for the edge of the world, it sounds like it was a pretty busy place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the edge of the world is the right, the, the right way to look at it. Um, but the edge of the world that was had a, an amazing, amazing sort of um, communication routes right from Rome, right way through the uh, to Europe, right way through um, Britain, up, up into the wall. So everybody was really well connected. Um, and you're right to say that the the, the there was more um, to the to the forts themselves than than just a military installation. Um, they were also uh, surrounded by a, a civilian settlement. Um, these were things were called the uh, vicus. There was a v or vicai, which is the the plural. Here's one here. This is um this is Roman chesters, um and you'll see just to the uh just to the to the west of the uh, the Roman fort. There's it's laid out. Surprise, as you can see, straddling the wall. So that the wall goes right way through the middle. Or it's actually knocked down, but certainly it you could go. It would have gone right through the middle of the fort. Um, and to the to the south of the fort, there is the uh, is the Roman settlement, um, the, the the civilian settlement. In these settlements, there was everything you could possibly need. It was almost like a bit of a wild west town. Um, there was um, inns, and taverns, and places to eat, places to buy food, places to buy the things you wouldn't be provided for with by the army. So there'd be you know there'd be um, food shops and armourers and, and people selling clothing and various everything you could possibly or every sort of little luxury you need to make to make life bearable up in here as well and also your families could live there too fantastic so presumably we know all of this because of the things that archaeologists have found uh in more recent times so uh perhaps we could talk about a few of those things and, and first and most importantly I, I think you'll agree we've got to talk about the toilets because there are some very impressive ones that still exist, aren't there? <laughs> toilets, um, the toilet housesteads are, are one of the, the most um, famous and one of the most favourite uh, remains that um, we have up there. This is a reconstruction, um, as you can see, uh, not exactly very private in those days, but I suppose you, know, you, live, in a, you live in a barracks. Um, and we can see there the way the way things work. It's an amazing the, the water supply in, in, in on Roman forts. In fact, Roman water supply anywhere of any 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 description is an amazing thing. And we can see that there's a there's a trough there that runs around the um, a, a, around the, 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 the central the central uh, paved area. Um, and this was to carry the water down that you would use to dip your sponge in on your stick. Which would you would use to uh, instead of loo roll? It may be sponge, it may be it may be sphagnum moss. Um, then that was taken away, washed, and brought back. Well, that is gross, Mark. Reusable loo roll, no thank you. Uh, and talking of pretty icky stuff, I know there was a bit of a mystery that was solved uh, in modern times uh, at the housesteads for, wasn't it? Yeah, um, the, the, the external settlements of, um, of housesteads and all of the thoughts have, have, haven't been really that well, well um, sort of researched or, or, or looked at in terms of archaeology. But the, uh, the south of the fort at housesteads was, um, was excavated in the, uh, the 19th phase. And um, under one of the houses, or one of the buildings, which was looked at and thought to have probably been an inn, I think it was, 
um, they've discovered under the floor two bodies, one larger, possibly male, um, and or male, I should say, and the, the a second, which was smaller, was probably a female. <clears throat> um, now, the strange thing about two bodies discovered under a house in a Roman settlement is that Romans didn't bury their dead in their settlements. They build them in, they bury people in cemeteries on the roads leading into their into their uh, their settlements, which we you know we have evidence of that as well. They did, however, bury infants. Sometimes babies could be buried under buildings, but certainly not adults. Um, so this was a bit of a conundrum, and, a, and there was a bit of head scratching going on. And until somebody discovered the fact that one of the bodies, the male, the larger body, had a uh, a piece of a, a tip of a, a tip of a knife, and um, in his in his spine, embedded in his spine, and it, it's it slowly dawned on them what it had there was more than likely um, some murder victims that had been done away with and buried under the house. A murder. And one can only assume it's probably because they didn't really wash their moss on a stick very well and someone got upset with that, <laughs> having to use it secondhand. And that's what happened. There's a lesson in there for us all, Mark. And uh, before we take our audience questions, we've got loads of them. This is your last chance to write your questions down now before we start asking them. Uh, one more incredible innovation that the Romans had that I'm always fascinated by is the hypercourse. So what can you tell us about that? Right, well, is it, this is a, um, a view of a hypercost. A hypercost is basically um, an underground heating system. So you imagine, I mean, it would be handy wherever you live, but you lived up on the Hadrian's Wall, North Northumberland, in the middle of wintertime, you're gonna need something to keep you warm. Um, and this one is from Housesteads, and this is from the uh, the commandant's house, the the the, the man in charge, the the big chief of the, uh, of, the, of, the of the of the of the Roman fort there. And basically, how it worked was that you see sort of stubs of stone um, on top of that. There was a flagged floor. You can see the the flagging there. There's been the last bit that's remaining. And if you look carefully to either side of the, below the wall level, there's two holes. Um, outside of the the hole, there'd be a, a furnace. A small fire would be lit in a furnace, and the hot air from that, from that fire would be allowed to drift under the floor and thereby heating the floor up underneath, and then probably up through flues to the wall. So it would be incredibly comfortable, incredibly nice and warm in the, in the commandant's house. That is incredible. I have literally lived in houses that didn't have proper central heating, and the Romans had it 2,000 years ago. It's amazing. Um, well, mm. it's been amazing talking to you, Mark. Thank you so much for helping us to understand how the Romans roamed. And uh, hopefully now you're ready to uh, answer some of the questions that we've had from people who are watching at home. We've had some fantastic ones. So let's take a little look, shall we? Um, firstly, uh, Megan, who's age 11 from Gruelthorpe, she says, hello, first and foremost. And then she asks Mark, how long did it take to build Hadrian's Wall? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, it we don't nobody knows for certain. Um, and here is what was built in a rather strange way. They didn't start at one end and move, I say, from Newcastle and move west. They didn't start from the, the from the west end and move east. What they did was they built it with the, a section of wall was taken on by a different section of the Roman army, the legionary army, not the auxiliary army, the legionaries, um, who would. Um, would be responsible for building a section. And they were probably built the turrets first and then fill the wall in between the turrets and then join each other up. And thank goodness they had some really sophisticated kind of um, surveying system that could get these things in line. Otherwise, there'd be gaps and the wall would miss each other. Um, so in, in, in that respect, we think we probably took between eight and ten years to build the whole thing, which I think is considering the terrain, the distance, the fact that they had to, to, to quarry more stone is quite a remarkable feat. So good question. Absolutely. Eight, eight to ten years. Yeah, I mean, that that is rapid, particularly when you consider how long and extensive that wall and the systems around it is. Uh, and I think there's a question here which actually relates to that. Um, Alicia, who's nine, asks, why did they build over the hill instead of going round it? <laughs> well, 
Um, yes, that's a very good question. Again, um, if you want to make something defensible, you you build it on a high on a piece of high ground. So there's not much point in having your wall, your defensive wall, overlooked by a big hill where people can sort of you know fire arrows or or whatever across the top of it. So it, to make it more visible, to make it more impressive. It goes on top of on top of the wall, on top of the sorry, on top of the the uh, the crags up in the very north, from the very centre of the Pennines, in top of Northumberland. So yeah, it, it's to do with being able to see the thing, to, to being impressive, and also to being defensive, I suppose, in a sense. Yeah. So it, even though it's harder and makes life more difficult, it's uh, it's more strategically sensible. Um, right. Yeah. Let's take another question. This is again about the sort of the building process. Um, how did, I don't have a name. Oh no, I do, sorry, it's Matthew who's aged eight. Matthew wants to know, how did they stop the barbarians from crossing the wall when they were building the wall? <laughs> again, that's a very good question. Um, the, the, the wall was being built by soldiers, I suppose, is the only you could think about it. And the, the way that the, um, they would defend, they would assume, I would assume, they would set up guards to defend the wall as it was being built. Um, but also that the fact that, that it may well have been that the, the, the barbarians were a bit more friendly than we think they were. And perhaps they were just, they, mm -hmm. you know, they, they just on this whole thing as a kind of a, you know, what the heck's going on? What's all this about? You know, who would who would ever think about building a wall across a whole complete country? They must, they must be mad. Absolutely. And, and there's a question, I guess, that follows on from that as well. This one's from Alexandra of Akula Douglas, who says, uh, what would they do in case of attack? Do we have any evidence, I suppose, of, of how the, the Romans would have repelled the barbarians? That's, again, these are, I must say, these are amazing questions. The Roman army didn't really work on defence, OK? They did not, they did not stand back and, and sort of, it, we could, under siege conditions like you might do in a castle. So they would actually rather fight an enemy in the field. They'd rather go, you know, be offensive as opposed to defensive. And that's why if you look at the forts, other than house steads, most of the forts straddle the wall, okay? So the, 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 the fort is on the walls in the centre and the, the forts on both sides. And that, that means on the north side of the wall, at the forts, there's three gates. On the south side, there's one gate. And that is because you get people outside those gates quicker and, and out into the field to do to defend the wall by offensive action as opposed to sitting behind the wall and firing arrows off it. So the, the Romans, if if they needed to do that, they would defend the wall by being offensive rather than just sitting behind and, and, you know, and cowering and, and waiting for the barbarians had gone away. OK, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I mean, we're talking about barbarians here, and we should probably uh, clarify that, obviously, to the Romans, they were barbarians, but not to <laughs> the barbarians themselves. They were people from Scotland um, and other, other tribes <laughs> north of the wall. Um, we've got a question here from Nina, which, which relates to that. Nina's 10, and she says, why did the Romans not take over Scotland and Ireland? Um, basically because it was too difficult um, and too difficult for, how am I going to put this, not a massive return, okay? So um, Wales was another another part of the, part of the country that we've got to think about in the same mix. Um, so Scotland was difficult to defend. Scotland was difficult to hold because of the mountainous condition, because the of what it was like as a as the terrain, what the place was like in itself. So the Romans did go through through to Scotland. They did establish the Antine Wall, um, you know, so twenty years after the building of Hadrian's Wall. But they really, that the, you know, it, the, it was a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of a lot of manpower, and it was much easier to come back down and establish a northern border. Okay, um, the similar thing goes for um, for Ireland. You know, it's another sea crossing. It's another whole series of men to be to 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 be sort of um, a, a, to to be sent to one place to to look after somewhere that really they weren't going to get a great deal of, of, of um, benefit from, and also by this time, by the time we've, we we're getting towards the conquest of Ireland, that the the, um, the, the, the policy had changed toward conquest anyway. 
The only difference is, is it's like things like Wales. Wales was because it was in the centre of the country, it was on, the, on the edge of the country, but still connected to, to Britain. It needed to be conquered because there was also a threat always coming in from the side. Um, so Wales is slightly different. But yeah, the, the reason why they didn't, they didn't con the, the, the conquest of Scotland didn't take place is because there was nothing to be gained from it. It was, it was just better to, you know, to, to, to stabilise the border. Wow, which I'm reading as if you're from Scotland or Wales or Ireland, you guys are tough. <laughs> Too tough for the Romans. Um, look, we've got time yeah. for one more question, Mark. So I'll throw this one at you. Uh, this is from Josh, Josh, Sophie and Aurelia, uh, who we've already shouted out to. Thanks so much for getting involved, guys. And they want to know, were there any other walls like this bordering other parts of the Roman Empire? Uh, not like this. Um, no, there was a there was a, a thing called the Limes, the wall that went down through through Germany um, uh, down towards the Rhine, which was um, which is a bit like the Antonine Wall, or a bit like the thirty miles of Hadrian's Wall from um, Bird Oswald to the coast, which is built out of timber and turf, a turf wall with a timber palisade on top. Um, of course, the one from Bird Oswald to the course was was replaced in stone, and of course, the Antonine Wall um, was abandoned. Um, and the, uh, the the Limes in, in in Germany was effectively a, a, a marker. It was a, I said this is the end of the empire, but it was never built in stone. So no, the 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 the, the magnificence of um, Hadrian's Wall is the fact that it is so huge, and it was such a monumental structure. Um, and built out of stone, and nothing to match it anywhere. And we have it here in England. There you go. That's why we've dedicated so much of this lesson to that phenomenal piece of architecture from all the way back in the Roman era. So thank you so much for all your questions, and thank you, Mark, for answering them so fully and with so much enthusiasm as well. I feel like we've all learnt loads there. Um, now, we are almost at the end of episode two, but before we go, I want to leave you with your next challenge, and that is to create your very own Roman mosaic. Now, if you've not heard of a mosaic before, a Roman mosaic uh, is a design made out of smaller materials that are assembled together to create a bigger picture. They were basically like Instagram, but for Romans, and were really popular throughout the Roman Empire now, they often use small pieces of stone known as tesserae to build theirs, but you can use whatever you like. It could be paper and card, shells, pebbles, pasta, whatever you have to hand. And you can choose whatever design you want to as well. So it might be something that's personal to you, or maybe you'd like to do one that you think the Emperor Hadrian would like. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea, I made this one. See that? It says my name. Uh, and I cut it out of lots of individual pieces of coloured paper and stuck it on some card. It took me ages, but it was loads of fun to do. Um, so you can uh, upload yours onto Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag History at Home Live or reply to the post on Facebook, uh, which is me holding up this that we'll post later on on the English Heritage page. Uh, and if you search online for English Heritage, English Heritage, sorry, make a Roman mosaic. You can find out more about these beautiful uh, decorations and get some tips for making your own too. So I can't wait to see them. Uh, and that is us for today. We are finished right now. So do join me again next week when we'll be talking all things castles, as well as checking out some of your marvellous mosaics. You won't want to miss it. And because we don't want you to miss it, this is a little heads up that for one week only, that's next week, we'll be with you on Thursday morning rather than Wednesday. So it's next Thursday that will be on set your reminders now and don't forget to visit the history at home section of our website just click on visit and then the history at home link um but for now though thank you for watching thank you to mark and we'll see you next time goodbye <laughs>